The United States Supreme Court ruled unanimously in favor of Catholic Social Services of Philadelphia this week. It's a landmark decision. In a 9-0 to zero ruling, the court found that the Catholic agency is entitled to its city contract to offer adoption services, despite the fact that its religious views prevent it from allowing adoptions by same-sex couples. Chief Justice John Roberts, in his written opinion, said that because the city allows exceptions to its policies by other agencies, it also must offer the same consideration in this case. According to Roberts, Catholic Charities, quote, seeks only an accommodation that will allow it to continue serving the children in Philadelphia in a manner consistent with its religious beliefs. It does not seek to impose those beliefs on anyone else. You were in South Carolina recently, yes. and a, uh, a Catholic priest uh, did not give you communion. He said it was because of your position on abortion. Were you offended by that? Uh, that's a private matter. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but uh, uh, it's the only time it's ever happened, and we didn't talk about it. He went to the press about it. Uh, and it's not a position that I've found anywhere else, including from the Holy Father who gives me communion. As the U.S. bishops began their spring meeting this week, Joe Biden and other Catholic politicians have been on the forefront of their minds at issue is whether to deny communion to pro-abortion politicians. The bishops discussed whether or not to issue a document on the subject. Here now with an insider's perspective of the USCCB spring meeting is the Archbishop of San Francisco, Salvatore Cordelioni. Archbishop, thank you for being here. I want to play a quick montage of some of this discussion and the heat it generated. Listen. We've never had a situation like this where the executive is a, a Catholic president who is opposed to, a, a, to the teaching of the church. The scandal has already happened to a certain degree, certainly within the good folks, some of the good folks in my own diocese who are scandalized by uh, that the U.S. bishops haven't come out yet with something clear. It's really... I think some of our public officials, those who advocate for abortion, no longer talk in the language of choice. They talk about it as a right. This is a Catholic president that's doing this. Archbishop Cordelion, uh, is the bishop's credibility on the line here? I believe it is. I, that's what I stated in my own intervention. Uh, uh, as I said, we're, uh, all eyes are on us right now. The whole country is looking at us. Are we going to be able to issue a document that is going to very clearly and convincingly uh, uh, present the Church's teaching on the Eucharistic consistency? It's not a political document. It's not politically motivated. But as I've said before, any great moral issue of the day has a political aspect to it. But it's not politics that's motivating us. It's we're promoting church teaching and protecting the integrity of the Blessed Sacrament. Mm. Bishop McElroy of San Diego was worried about emphasizing abortion and life issues over the other issues. Listen. Once we legitimate public policy-based Eucharistic exclusion as a regular part of our teaching office, and that is the road to which we are headed, that sacrament which seeks to make us one will become for millions of Catholics, the sign of division. This trajectory and limitation to abortion and euthanasia will fatally undermine the ability of the church in the U.S. to witness with credibility to the integrity of Catholic social teaching, including the church's condemnation of racism, poverty, and environmental destruction. Archbishop, would this embrace Eucharistic exclusion and obscure those other issues in Catholic social teaching? First of all, uh, Bishop Rhodes, the chairman of the Doctrine Committee, made it very clear that the document is not going to single out any one issue. It may mention a number of different issues as examples of direct attacks on human life and dignity, but will not single them out. Sadly, Catholics are divided on this issue of abortion, but uh, the bishops have call it the preeminent issue of the day. It's not just another policy issue. As I just said a moment ago, every big moral question has a political dimension. So I look back in history uh, where we now shudder in horror in mid-19th century, the, our country had to have, go to war over the question of slavery. We shudder in horror that there were, there were slaves at one time. Slavery existed in this country. Uh, going back um, about 60, 70 years ago, that 
the lack of civil rights in pre-civil rights South. We shudder in horror to think that uh, some people, African Americans, were even lynched, and this was condoned and even celebrated by some uh, leaders in the pre-civil rights South. Where were the U.S. bishops on that? On the issue of slavery, they were quiet. Well, the church was just beginning. It was a very uh, in a vulnerable position, trying to fit into the American experiment. That was quite a challenge for Catholics early on in the immigration. And uh, the bishops, despite the uh, emphatic teachings of the Pope uh, denouncing slavery, were um, were complacent uh, in order not to create any political waves. A hundred years later, uh, clergy, religious, and and the lay people in the Catholic Church join forces with other faith leaders to bring about civil rights. Someday, people will look back on this era of history and shudder in horror at the devastation that's been done in, uh, in the massacring life in the womb. Where were the bishops now, then, they'll be asking, which is now? Uh, I think this is an uh, issue that is distinct from the others, but this document is going to address this comprehensively and not single out any particular issue. There seemed to be a lot of concern, Archbishop, about the section on Eucharistic consistency that's being proposed here, listing types of Catholics who might be running afoul of church teaching and therefore not worthy to receive communion. Listen to some of those concerns. I'm hearing more and more is discrepancy. What is this document intended to do? And then the repeated interventions that it's about uh, the time with a Catholic president who doesn't agree with church teaching on abortion. If, in fact, you remove the section on consistency by which you name uh, individuals, then maybe I would take another look at it. Archbishop, your reaction, why are they so afeard of calling out Catholics failing in their public faith? It seems to me some of these bishops are worried uh, about that the faithful will point to the document and demand action from them. Well, that could happen. Uh, I, I can't speak for them as to why they're, they would be opposed to it. Uh, again, maybe it's seeing this as being politically motivated. But this is sound Catholic teaching about properly disposed to receiving uh, Holy Communion. It was even in, we pray the Liturgy of the Hours in the Office of Reading, the second longer reading from St. Cyprian, just today in today's office. He spoke about, if I'm in a state of sin uh, and I and not, I'm not disposed to receiving Holy Communion, basically was the gist of what he was saying. So this is Catholic teaching from day one going back to St. Paul. And to mm -hmm. believe otherwise is not really coherent with the Catholic understanding of the Eucharist. How, the, quite, the sticky point is how do we apply this in a very politically delicate and volatile situation? And that's why I've said before, bishops have to make judgments uh, according to their own mind and within their own conscience, and we all have to respect that decision. Well, and, and as you pointed out repeatedly on this program and elsewhere, canon law places requirements on the bishop to make that judgment. It's not something you've just dreamt up. It's in the canon law. And when a public figure departs from church teaching, it's very different from a private figure in the silence of their own soul departing from church teaching. And I think that this idea of public scandal leading others into error, that's been completely lost. In fact, I heard very little of it in the discussion today. Yes, there were some bishops who pointed it out, but that is a major concern. So this document, it's envisioned, it's for all, the whole Catholic people. But it will mention the special re responsibility of Catholics in public life. It won't single out, again, any one category of, of people. Mm -hmm. It may mention some walks of life uh, as examples, but it's all Catholics who are prominent in public life have a responsibility to give a faithful witness to the values of our faith. This is not some kind of idea of imposing our religion on, the, on, on others, but it's witnessing right. to the basic values of justice and truth and, and charity uh, that yeah. our faith it's in, within the natural moral law that our faith supports and champions. What about the charge that uh, we heard in some of the debate that this was originally a document about the worthiness of communion for public officials, but now it's being advertised as a general teaching document on the Eucharist, not a national policy? I don't recall uh, the proposal of a national policy, it may have been, it may have been proposed at one point. 
but early, if there was early on, that course was changed. So let's remember the, the background of this. This all came about after the election of President Biden. Uh, so this is as an added consideration for us now that we have a Catholic in the White House who's opposing us on some very critical issues. Uh, Archbishop Gomez followed the recommendation he received to form a working group to advise him on interacting and engaging with the new administration. That working group suggested two things. One was issuing a letter on the day of the inauguration, which he did, and the other was to ask the doctrine committee to write uh, a document on the Eucharist and the life of the church. So this is how it all came about. It was originally envisioned as, as a document coming from the, docu the doctrine committee addressing mm -hmm. this uh, matter of Eucharistic coherence. It may have been proposed as a policy at one point, and I know a letter we received from an official at the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith did mention that as, as one way of approaching this. So I know it did receive some conversation because of that, but eventually, um, and soon, it was decided not to adopt a national policy, but rather a, a robust, theologically comprehensive teaching document. There was much invoking of Cardinal Ladaria's letter of a few weeks ago. Bishop John Stowe of Lexington had this to say, addressing Archbishop Gomez. Listen. I noticed that in your opening remarks, you quoted from a letter from Archbishop De Noia, but you did not mention the letter from Cardinal Ladaria, who I believe set forth a process by which we should discuss uh, and take our time. It seems that some of the brother bishops want to rush this discussion and to focus the emphasis on a teaching document on the Eucharist about whether our Catholic president is able to receive communion. It should be said that Cardinal Ladaria, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, in his letter does not say the bishop shouldn't vote on proceeding with a draft document. Your reaction, Archbishop? Indeed, he doesn't. He gives us additional advice uh, in terms of forming a national policy, but again, we're not doing that. But at the start of the letter, he cites the letter that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger sent to the U.S. bishops in 2004 that then we didn't know about because the then Cardinal McCarrick, he gave the letter to him. It was written for the bishops, a private letter to all the bishops, but he withheld it so we didn't know about it. Cardinal Ladaria, now we, we have the letter available. He cites that letter and says to use the, the principles in this letter in drafting our own document on Eucharistic coherence. And Cardinal Ratzinger is very clear, very reasonable, pastorally sound what to do about dialogues with these public officials have to take place to try to move them to a conversion of heart. And if after many attempts it, it becomes clear that this is fruitless, then they have to be declared not to be admitted to communion. He makes that very clear. He also speci specifically cites the issues of abortion and euthanasia. It's not exclusive of that, but it's, he cites them as particularly grave issues. Yeah. There was a motion early on to extend this debate uh, over this, uh, whether the, the doctrine committee should continue with a document or be permitted to write a document. Fifty-nine percent of the bishops opposed that, and it was uh, Archbishop Nauman depicted that as a delay tactic. All of this feels uh, like some are determined to slow walk any teaching on this topic of Eucharistic credibility and, and uh, a worthiness of, of receiving communion. I, I, reading and listening to some of this debate, you feel they'd like it to end in 2025 or sometime afterward. Is that the sense you had listening to this, that people want to slow walk this so they don't have to deal with the uncomfortable conversations with public officials who happen to be Catholic and depart from Catholic teaching? I do sense a lot of nervousness over this. It is very unpleasant. None of us, and uh, those of us advocating going forward with this document, um, this isn't a pleasant thing for us. Uh, but yeah. we don't, deciding to do the right thing very often is not pleasant. But I think there's, there's a lot of nervousness and what the con potential consequences could be, um, what the political fallout could be. There's, there, it's a very complex matter, but we need to do the right thing, uh, regardless, in a, a charitable way, with humility, as Bishop Daly said, with humility and, and uh, compassion and in the truth. But we have to be very clear and courageous. So 
that's why I uttered the message that uh, St. John Paul constantly reminded us of the biblical injunction, be not afraid. Yeah. We must not be ruled yeah. by fear. We must be ruled by what is the right thing to do and the circumstances in which we find ourselves now. And in any event, we won't get a document until, until November. And, and Archbishop, we have to be very clear just so the viewers understand. No matter what this statement says, and it's going to be a teaching document, it really is up to every individual bishop in his diocese to judge the situation of these public figures and whether they should be denied communion or not. Exactly. And that's why I see it as a resource for bishops. It will be very theologically robust and comprehensive. It envisions explaining that it won't be a disciplinary document, but it will explain the theology underlying the church's discipline. Mm -hmm. So it's a great reference for a bishop to use a resource in guiding his own thinking and discernment on how to promote church teaching and apply church discipline within the context of his own diocese. Yeah, and I know you all are having a larger conversation about a Eucharistic revival, but you can't have a Eucharistic revival if there's no public demonstration and example of what the sacredness of the Eucharist looks like in practice. And right now, that's clearly being violated in many, many quarters. So it's a worthy uh, topic, and certainly I don't know what could be more worthy of the bishop's time. I, I want to get your reaction before we expire here uh, to the U.S. Courts, Supreme Court's unanimous decision today ruling in favor of Catholic social services in Philadelphia, allowing them to continue to offer adoption services to heterosexual married couples only, consistent with Catholic teaching. Is this a victory for conscience, Archbishop? Absolutely. I must I confess I haven't had a chance to read the decision yet, but I, I know about the decision. And clearly it is a victory for conscience. Uh, adoption agencies should be free to put children up in the homes that they think are best prepared to raise the child well, and they should not be forced to violate their conscience in this service that they're providing to the whole community without discrimination on uh, who they're serving. We believe it there. Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni, we thank you so much for your time. And uh, I have to say, I was amused by some renowned law professors and advocate groups that uh, publicly attacked and savaged the former president. Now they're doing the victory lap, praising these legal decisions, uh, you know, and groups for the decision. Uh, but today's decision, whatever your reaction to it, is clearly the fruit of the Supreme Court justices appointed by the last president. Uh, Archbishop Cordelioni, thank you for your time. You're welcome.